Okay, so now that we have the, this tool of the ordinal height uh, function, we can compare what we're doing now. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we can compare it to Veblen and sort of get a sense of how it compares with the OCF we were doing before. Um, and it also lets us talk about um, a couple of things that I know confused me when I was looking at this in terms of how how does this work and how does this not run into some of the traps that you tend to find with uh, with other things. So the first thing is you might think we would run into a trap at this point. Um, you know that epsilon naught is very special, that it's a fixed point of omega exponentiation. And so if that's your way of creating new things, for example, that's the Veblen phi naught function, um, then you run into a fixed point and then you have to do a little bit of work to get yourself out of that trap. Um, but let's look at what, what happens. For example, if you do the phi one uh, at the three level twice on omega naught, okay, and I'm just gonna look at the ordinal height of that, um, that's gonna be the soup of take phi one of three omega naught, just ha you've done it once, and then you iterate, this is the soup over k, then you iterate the two level guy an infinite number of times, which in terms of uh, ordinary ordinals just means look at the, the supremum of all the finite iterates, okay? So let's see what happens at the, this, the first time you do that, you put this thing into a two level and you look at the ordinal height. Well, if you believe what I was saying in the last video, that's just taking epsilon naught times two to the epsilon naught. Well, it's the same deal as we had with, with omega naught, exactly the same argument tells you that, well, that's just epsilon naught, but this is epsilon naught squared. And that isn't epsilon naught. So this epsilon naught times here actually is really, really nice. It means that we've actually avoided that fixed point. Okay, and now do it again, epsilon naught squared times two to the epsilon naught squared, exactly the same uh, ordinal arithmetic tells you that's epsilon naught to itself. That is not something that degenerates. We've seen that before. We use this as uh, one of the primary tools in the Buchholz style OCF in the, the last like 10 videos or whatever. Um, this is something that uh, has much less of a fixed point trap than exponentiation with a fixed space. This is x to the x um, instead of like I take a fixed alpha like omega naught or even epsilon naught or something and use that as a fixed space for an exponential function. Okay, so in fact that's that's really okay. It's going to keep getting bigger. Um, when we when we do that, okay. So in fact, what we get is if we throw away the fundamental sequences and just look at the the usual ordinal height, um, we're getting into Veblen territory. Now, unfortunately, we're already using phi for our new functions. I'm going to use capital V for the Veblen, and hopefully, it won't be too confusing because I'm not going to talk about Veblen too much, okay. Turns out, um, not going to do the details, but it turns out if you now start putting an omega naught into the control argument, so this is the first time we've taken advantage of the fact that we can even use any infinite ordinal in the control argument here, turns out that the height of that is the omega th Veblen function applied to zero, okay? Um, but that's not the full power of even the phi one function. The phi one function is able to use an omega two, or sorry, um, let's see, uh, no, an omega-2 here, I really should say omega-2. This is able to use an omega-2 element in the control slot to control its operation on omega-1 elements. So let's do that. So the simplest element of omega-2, big omega-2, is little omega-1. Okay, a uh, little bit of a disappointment here, although we'll come back to a nice use of this, which is that if we put in omega-1, this is the first time we've actually been able to use diagonalization. By definition, this guy says, okay, um, omega one is a function on little omega one is a function on big omega one, and so we can put the omega naught in this slot and in this slot diagonalize. But guess what? Little omega one is the identity function, and we just get what we were just looking at: phi one of omega naught omega naught. Okay, so that's not really anything new. We're still at the Veblen omega level. Okay, but just one little thing, and this is a classic example of the do a limit and then do the successor trick. Now let's look at omega one plus one as the control variable. Okay, so that means take the, the, the phi one with power omega one uh, function, iterate that infinitely many times on omega naught, even though the first time you run that, you're not gonna get anything different. After that, this function is gonna be really powerful because this is gonna tell you every time you put in a new argument,
you're going to diagonalize. Okay. Um, so what are we going to get? A little more explicitly, we're going to get that this function, this the, the output of this function, that's going to be something in big omega 1. It's going to have an ordinary fundamental sequence. The kth element of that is do this thing k times on omega naught. And as soon as you do that more than once, it gets really powerful. Turns out that that replicates um, the Veblen, where you recycle the Veblen argument into the subscript. And guess what? If you do that an arbitrary number of times, you get already up to gamma naught. So we're, we're cruising here. So we've already maxed out the single variable uh, Veblen functions here just by putting in a tiny little bit more than the minimal omega, big omega 2 argument into phi 1. Okay, so that's that's showing that we're getting really powerful, and we're going to go much further than that in terms of how intricate this control argument can be. Okay, so again, I'm not going to prove that, but hopefully, it's you can you can start to believe that um, that this is pretty powerful. Okay, um, so but then you might think there's another fixed point trap. Okay, um, because after all, this is something where the one variable Veblen function just fails to give give anything new and you have to artificially get it out of the fixed point trap and go on and then that leads eventually to um to the ocf idea um but this is really much more like the ocf idea than than it is like veblen and one thing that's that's important to note um it's not i'm not going to talk too much about this but the phi functions are not normal functions in, uh, it's a very important notion for ordinals. In particular, they're not continuous in the ordinal sense. They don't satisfy, they're not continuous in this argument here, the right-hand argument. If this is a, an equality you can sometimes really like to be true, you take some, uh, some sequence of betas, or any family of betas, doesn't have to be like an ordinary sequence. You look at what phi sub n with a fixed alpha does on all those betas. You look at the limit of that, the supremum of those guys. Is that the same thing as if you had taken the supremum of all those betas in the first place and just put that one argument into the appropriate slot of phi sub n? Okay. Um, well, even with when you throw away the fundamental sequence data, this is just not true. Um, and that's not particularly uh, pathological at all. The successor function is, of course, one of our favorite functions. That's not a normal function. Um, let's just look at that. The simplest example here is that if I take a bunch of numbers k, if I add one to all of them and take the supremum of all those guys, well, that's just the supremum of all the integers, uh, and that's just omega by definition. That's a, not the same thing as first take the supremum of all the integers, which is omega again, and add one, because omega and omega plus one are not the same thing. What we saw, this was one of the things that was annoying uh, about when I was looking at the, the OCF story and the, the slow growing hierarchy. And one of the reasons that I had to put a lot of, of warnings and fudge statements into, um, and sort of weasel words into, is this fact that some of the, when you, when you add things to each other in the wrong way uh, for ordinals, you get confusing, you get kind of confusing results. And there's a lot of special cases where like, well, as long as things are written in a standardized way, this nice thing will happen. Otherwise, who knows what the heck's going to happen, okay? Um, and it turns out that this method with the uh, tree ordinals and, and looking at the fees, it seems, I think all of that goes away. All of that annoying stuff goes away. It's really, it's really cool, okay? Um, so this non-normality here is actually really good because it's a really quick and easy proof, you can look at it on um, Wikipedia, um, that any normal function has fixed points. And in fact, Veblen, the, the Veblen idea says, start with any normal function and you can get a hierarchy of fixed points of that function and then fixed points of that and fixed points of that. Um, and none of that really applies to the fees events. Okay, so that's one way if you're wondering, um, are we gonna get trapped in the same way Veblen does? We're not going to. So it's really much more like an OCF uh, an ordinal collapsing function thing than like a Veblen, even though we can compare the smallest values, the simplest values to, to Veblen. Okay, so let's go a little bit more. Okay, um, so as, as I said, it's really, this is really an elegant OCF. Um, elegant for our purposes, because we like fundamental sequences. 
if you don't like fundamental sequences, if you think those of those as, as um, unnecessary extra data, it's not the right way to go. But of course, we need them and we love them. Okay, so let's look at, for example, phi sub two. We haven't uh, looked at phi sub two yet. Well, by definition, so phi sub two is going to take something in the omega two level and create something new in the omega two level. And depending on what this control argument is, it's going to be a more and more sophisticated function. But the the start is exactly what we're used to. The zero version is is successor. Just like before, the one version is doubling. You can double an uncountable ordinal. It totally makes sense. The same exact definition. You can double an some uh, you know one of these uncountable ordinals beta times. It just means that you might have to unpack that beta a whole lot more than you did before. But these are totally sensible as um, well-defined tree ordinals. Okay. So in particular, um, what if we do the kind of thing that that I'm talking about with these T sub n classes? We start with one of our standardized ingredients. In this case, little omega one. We do the phi two uh, function with strength two, control argument two. And if you just strip out the fundamental sequences and look at the ordinal height of that, it turns out to be just exactly omega one squared. Very very straightforward thing to do to omega one which happens to be the least uncountable ordinal, okay? And what about the three? The ordinal height of what happens when you put in three, it's exactly the same as I was talking about before. This is gonna be take omega one and do a tower, an arbitrarily large tower of exponents on that guy, and then take the limit. And that is, that is an epsilon number as a usual ordinal. It's an epsilon number. It's the next epsilon number after omega one itself. Okay, so this is this is the kind of thing you see all over ordinal arithmetic um, is, hey, I've got some omega one, uh, that in itself is an epsilon number, and then this is going to be the next thing, uh, the next thing after that. Okay, and that should look familiar. Okay, um, we we used to call this. Remember, we were calling this guy in the. Um, Buchholz style ordinal collapsing function in the previous years, we were calling that big omega. And this is the limit of big omega to itself to itself, big omega to the omega to the omega to the omega to the omega, a tower of big omegas. When we put that into the OCF thing that we used to call psi um, and collapsed it, we got exactly the Bachman Howard ordinal. Okay, so it shouldn't be a huge surprise, though I'm not going to prove it, is that if we put in this. Omega two guy created using phi two, but in a fairly straightforward way. This is really just a tower of ordinal exponentiation with very particular choices of fundamental sequences. You put that in as the control argument into the phi one function, and use that on omega naught. It turns out to exactly replicate that ordinal collapse function, um, and you get exactly the Bachman Howard ordinal. So already. Only using phi one, phi two, the number three, and little omega zero and a little, little omega one, we've gotten up to the Bachman Howard ordinal. We've replicated everything we ever did before in terms of ordinals. That gives you an idea of how powerful this is going to be. Okay. Um, good place to stop because about 13 minutes.